Good afternoon. This is the regular meeting of the Board of Regents of Del Mar College District convening at 1.02 p.m. We are two minutes late. Sorry for that. We try to be on time here. On Tuesday, April 11, 2017, in the Eisensee Boardroom at the Harvard Student Center. We do have a quorum, and so I'm going to call the meeting to order. And this is our tradition. We're going to begin with a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, Sandra, our world globetrotter, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank you is to read together the mission statement of Del Mar College. So please join me. Del Mar College provides access to quality education, workforce preparation, and lifelong learning for student and community success. One further reminder, Del Mar College is streaming the live audio and video from the official Board of Regents meetings on the college's website in real time, with the exception of portions of the meeting considered as closed session by statute. We're going to begin today as we do with our recognitions, and we have an uh, exceptionally special recognition today. And I guess, is, uh, Dr. Escamillo, are you going to tee this one up, or is Mary or both of you? Mary and I both will. I, yeah. let's, come let's come on down, Mary. As Mary's coming up, I just want to begin by saying that yesterday we were able to have a press conference. Uh, regarding this topic that we're going to introduce to everyone and celebrate here because that's what it is a celebration of Jean and Ellen, Ellen's uh, Siemens um, generosity and public service and just great hearts uh, uh, as members of the community that's what this is about ladies and gentlemen and it's just it's just my pleasure to introduce Jean and Ellen uh, Seaman who are here uh, to uh, share in that celebration and, and in their generosity. Mary, would you cue them up, please? Yes. Um, yesterday we announced uh, the full endowment for the $100,000 Jean and Ellen Seaman scholarship for GED students. And, um, and, I, and I really want to thank both Seamans for allowing us to do this recognition. Um, neither of us really like, neither of them really want to have this kind of recognition. But with Mr. Seaman being part of the foundation board and understanding that getting the information out to the community and letting them know that this is a powerful way to change people's lives, they were kind enough to let us do this recognition, and I'm, I'm very, very thankful for that. During that uh, recognition, um, there's a really fun check that was a mortar board and a scholar, a, a diploma. Um, but more importantly, there was a young woman who uh, in 2013, after 20 years of not having uh, a high school diploma, she dropped out of school when she was in the eighth grade. And she now had a family and she had two children and she needed to make a better living for her children. And so in 2013, she came to Del Mar to say, I want to go to college and then that's when we got her into the GED program here at Del Mar College, and she finished her GED in something like three months. She was a recipient of the uh, Jean and Ellen Seaman GED scholarship program, which allowed her then to start her career. She is now level two in the nursing program. Yes. She was yeah. incredibly articulate. Um, she is the reason why we do the GED programs, why we do scholarships, empowering people to be their potential. And it was an, an incredibly heartfelt, wonderful, warm afternoon to say thank you to the Siemens <coughs> and for them to see how they impacted people's lives. 
um, I'd like to ask Mr. Seaman to come up and say a few words. I don't say a few words without my wife's advice. <laughs> I got all my friends here. Uh, frankly, and I hate to have my back to you, you're really the more important audience right there. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> well, uh, we're very embarrassed about this. They paid s such attention to us yesterday at that reception and, and out today. I'm really, we are embarrassed. Uh, and over the weekend, I don't know how many of you get Forbes, but Forbes listed all of the billionaires in uh, the world, and over a thousand of them in in U.S. And it uh, uh, starts with those with 100 billion and goes on down. Some of my friends in there, a local boy named Bob Rowling. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, anyways, when I see that, I got so embarrassed. I said, "What am I going to do there?" <laughs> The recognition, such a pittance of an uh, of an award, of uh, a donation, but it, uh, on the other hand, uh, as we talk about uh, the importance of GED, rescuing people who have fallen out and want to get back into the system, like that young lady yesterday, so articulate, so fantastic. What a dream story that we can take GEDs, and then Mark and I have talked about the two pathways, uh, GED rescuing that group, or over here, the ones who really make it, the, the dual credit people in the high schools, that the two pathways to success. And so, as embarrassed as we are, we are pleased to be recognized. One last thing, and uh, it's just interesting how God provides talking points, but Saturday's uh, Wall Street Journal, the, the American Dream, <coughs> there it is, the American Dream, and the quote is, in the United States, you can start from anywhere and become anything. Next quote, you can go from the bottom to the top. So thank you for the recognition, and we're pleased to do this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Chairman, may I make a comment? Sure. Um, Mr. <clears throat> Seaman has been so gracious to Del Mar, and um, so he's got his Del Mar family, as I do, and I would also want to tell you that he is a lover of the arts and has been such a great help to the Corpus Christi Symphony, which was part of my growing up right here on this campus, and for that, thank you very much, sir, and you and your family are truly blessed. Thank you. Well, it's hard to top that. <laughs> but we do have a very special group we'd like to recognize next. I'm going to invite Lenora Keyes to the podium to introduce them. Thank you very much. And I think that's great transition, actually, because we're here to recognize our Small Business Development Center they're amazing staff and leadership, and nobody moves people forward better than small business, and especially here in South Texas. And uh, I'd like to ask Ann Farova to step forward, please, and Dan Chorus, and then for her staff to stand. Thank you. Uh, the Small Business Development Center started here over 20 years ago, and Ann Farova has been the director for at least 22 years, and I've had the privilege of working with her over the past years. As you may know, they're located in our Center for Economic Development. And this past month, we finally had a National Day of Recognition for Small Business Development Centers. And part of that came from our city of Corpus Christi and Mayor uh, Lucio Rubio, Mayor Pro Tem, had a, had a proclamation for our Small Business Development Center staff. Before I read that, I'd like to share just a little bit of their accomplishments over this last year. This last year, they were able to assist small businesses in Corpus Christi in our Gulf Coast area of over 514 businesses and with over $10 million in new financing and over $24 million in created additional sales. So this is direct impact to our local economy. 
they helped to start brand new 34 businesses and 22 business expansions. And as we all recognize, it's small business that really creates the most jobs in our economy. And our staff here is right at the forefront in all of that. And I'd like to read a little bit of the proclamation that the city of Corpus Christi provided for our staff. It says, whereas the Texas Small Business Development Center, SBDC, has had success building the Texas economy one business at a time. Since 1986, the Texas SBDC network has provided small business assistance starting and growing Texas's small businesses. This is very impressive. Whereas in 2016, there was a record year for Texas XBDC clients, creating almost 15,000 jobs in excess of $576 million in new capital and sales of $1.3 billion. Whereas the Del Mar College SBDC continues to demonstrate the hard work and commitment that has helped Texas become the nationwide leader in job creation and small business growth. Now, therefore, pursuant to the powers vested in me, Prayer Pro Tem of the City of Corpus Christi, Mayor Pro Tem R Lucy Rubio declared National Small Business Development Center Day. And, um, and so we'd like to recognize our own staff. And this is under the leadership of Ann Farova. She is the director of the Small Business Development Center. And Dan Corris is the dean of corporate services and workforce development and her entire staff. And Ann, would you like to make a statement? Oh, sure. <clears throat> I'll make it nice and short and sweet. Um, nothing we could do because could be done without the support of this organization providing us with a home with which to work out of and all the support we get all year long. And all this is truly due to the incredible staff we have. And we have a great, great staff of very learned folks that have dedicated their, um, their current lives um, to helping all these businesses be in a better position um, when they leave our doors than when they came in. So thank you for your time, and thank you for your efforts to continue to support us. Thanks to you all. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to invite to the podium Claudia Jackson, who's going to give a staff report, uh, first staff report related to the legislative uh, session that's underway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Each month we aspire to try to make uh, these reports as effective and relevant as possible. You have a spreadsheet in front of you that's um, horizontal in format that gives you the things that we are watching that are really moving forward quickly. Uh, but I'll just hit a couple of highlights. Currently, budget bills in both houses pro uh, propose to fund Del Mar College more than $32 million for the biennium. The Senate's proposal is $616,000 more than the House's uh, version, but they're still very close. This compares to our final biennium budget of just over $29 million last session. In the success points funding, the state is proposing to pay us $211 per point the House only $167 per point, um, but a late amendment that literally uh, came in after the board packets were sent out uh, added $20 million in success points statewide, and I think we're still, unless Dr. Escamilla has an update I don't have, we don't know how that would break out across the 50 community colleges yet, but we'll, we're watching that carefully. Is that, that, is that that's fair? That's right, and I'm, I'm going to learn more on uh, Thursday when I'm in Austin. Okay. Um, just as a reminder, when you look at those, those two numbers, 167 and, and 211, when they passed the success points funding legislation two, two sessions ago, they were uh, proposing 185 per point, and last session they paid us 170-something or another. Me too. Anyway, we keep getting discounted almost at every turn. Um, so I'm just going to hit a couple of highlights that are on this spreadsheet, and if you have questions further on, we'll go on. The only bill that has literally made it all the way through its initial chamber of the, of the legislature and gone to a committee of the other house is Senate Bill 7. Um, if, if the little bullets out the side talk to you about the, number, the, the amount of progress each of those bills has made, uh, and it, it is the one on improper relationships between educators and students. 
Interestingly enough, we're in the middle of April, and none of the House bills have been voted out of their respective committees. So uh, there's a lot that is at least pending in the House, and we'll see what happens with that. There are two bills that uh, Dr. Escamilla is a, a, a linchpin of the TACC Legislative Committee and the whole TACC organization are watching very carefully. Uh, one of them is HB 2994 that formalizes the reimbursement statutes for providing workforce continuing education for 16 and 17 year old students in programs such as welding and certified nurse aid uh, certification. In addition to the uh, base budget bill. This was the TACC's second uh, priority for this year, and I know Dr. Escamilla is going to talk a little bit more about, about that in a minute. Uh, the other one that uh, was on our original list is a 961, and that has to do with uh, proposing changes in, they call it trustee, but it, on our case it would be regent elections. And there's a number of different components of that bill that are very problematic, and I know uh, Regent Carol Scott has been working with Augie Rivera and me and, and those folks up in Austin to try to see if we can ferret out what's going on. And literally, s since before this meeting started, uh, we've gotten an email that tries to explain what's happening with that. The, uh, the original intent w from other community colleges was just to make sure that in at least some of their races for regional trustee seats, the, the potential to uh, elect someone by, by plurality would exist. And what this does is save community colleges that, are, that don't currently have that system the cost and the, the, uh, um, all the e extra time and effort for having runoffs when we're talking about region or trustee elections. Before the bill got all the way through the, the process and got filed, there was a whole bunch of other language that had to do with numbering each seat and people having to designate even in an at-large uh, race which seat they were running for and it, it just got very convoluted. What I'm understanding just from this email just now is that that was never the intent of the draft or the legislator drafting this legislation. But they were tr that, that happened somewhere along um, the process of either the staff not understanding or maybe the legislative council putting language in there that they thought might clean up uh, old, or earlier provisions and older problems. But from the, the lens, I think the three of us are, at least are looking at it right now, it's only gonna make things a little more garbled. So the, the, the last part about that one is they do not expect this one to be considered by committee this week, so we have a little more time to work on it. So Dr. Esme, you can, you can probably save us from this one while you're up there if you get the chance. Um, we will keep you posted on that one. Just um, on the federal front, I will give you a couple of other updates. Education Secretary Betty DeVos is now considering returning uh, summer grant Pell Grant opportunities. She's uh, kind of nibbled around the edges of that for, for a, a while now. And um, we do know that eligible students who utilize Pell Grants do improve their overall retention and completion rates. Um, and we know it, it also helps us make, make sure we can uh, provide that educational access and completion in a timely manner. She said something that was just reported yesterday as well. Secretary DeVos is open to discussions of allowing eligible students to use Pell Grant funds for dual credit and early college programs. Uh, last fall, we had nearly 2,000 students across the coastal bend enrolled in uh, dual credit classes, nearly 3,500 classes. So we know that uh, there, there's some real potential there for if that were to happen for our region to, to see some benefit. And I have reached out to Congressman uh, Blake Farenthal's office uh, and found out that he has indications to uh, uh, be supportive of more access to Pell Grants. So other than that, if there are questions, I will be happy to try to answer them. Questions, comments, Carol, anything you'd add from a legislative standpoint? I'm participating on weekly calls with uh, the TAC Legislative Committee, the CAT Legislative Committee, the lobbyist, and the internal staff. Those happen on Mondays. Mark is in regular communication on the, the TAC side as, as a member of the board and executive committee now. Yes, so, so we've got uh, good input into the discussions that are happening and I've been uh, up there on a couple of additional occasions since community college day to try to help out where I can, so. 
So we're, we're trying to keep the three of us in communication and the state in communication, and I think it's, I think it's working. So far, we're seeing good results. Excellent. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you, Claudia. You. Uh, next is uh, <coughs> College President's Report, Dr. Escamilla. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. I'd like to begin with a, an opportunity that I had with students on March 27th. Uh, that was Pizza with the President, and I'm proud to report that uh, 136 students showed up um, at varying times. They're, we were very flexible to work with their schedules, and we had a stack of pizzas that I, I, I've never seen so many pizzas in my life, and every last morsel was gone. <laughs> I am proud to More importantly, or as importantly, because food's always important to fuel the students, as few the students uh, experience, um, there were some great questions asked. Uh, tremendously um, interested individuals who are interested in everything from financial aid, um, tuition costs, uh, concealed, concealed carry uh, issues and those sorts of things as we're developing. Um, just, just a tremendously powerful group of students and I so appreciate it. The other day I reported this to someone, I forget who it was, just in passing, and they asked me how important I thought uh, that activity was. I said, that is critical. If we are not listening to our students, then what are we doing here, is how I responded. Because it, it, that's, that's just how I feel about it. I know that's how this board feels about it, and I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here in this room, but I think it's important for our, our viewers out there who are listening and watching uh, this report to know how important it is to us, and especially those students. So we'll continue with that. Uh, on, on March 29th, um, this is what uh, Ms. Jackson was alluding to earlier, um, I was privileged and honored to uh, represent not only Del Mar College, but the Texas Association of Community Colleges at the House Higher Ed Committee, uh, chaired by our very own J.M. Lozano. Um, and I was testifying on House Bill 2449, and that is the bill, again, that uh, Claudia was talking about regarding um, opening up the ages uh, for um, um, continuing education opportunities. You know, that is a critical piece of uh, legislation that will have a huge impact on this college and this community um, and they know that um, it was it was nice to be um, up there on on, uh, on the dais with my colleague uh, Mike Simon who's a president of, president of Angelina College as well as chairman uh, state representative uh, Trent Ashby uh, who actually sponsored the legislation from the, from the house side um, it is a much is such a different time um, Carol, and what you were talking about, excuse me, Regent Scott, what you were talking about with, uh, with regard to the momentum and all the things going on, it is such a different time uh, with, at the legislature as it's at, very different than it's ever been since I've been here. And I just got to say there's so much goodwill and political will in support of our colleges, and this piece of legislation was, was uh, evidence of that. On March 30th, um, I was, which was the following morning actually, when I was up there in Austin, I was also honored to, to host a meeting with Chairman Todd Hunter, Chairman of Calendars on the, in the House side, uh, with uh, hosting the uh, Texas Association of Community Colleges Executive Committee. We, that was a meeting with the Chairman to kind of uh, go back and touch bases with him uh, from, the tr from, the, uh, from the President's Association to, to, uh, to let him know what we've done uh, let them know what we've heard and to listen. And the chairman was so gracious. He and his staff is always so wonderful to us uh, with not only hosting us, but giving us their very valuable time and uh, opinions and direction even, uh, op opinions about their direction as to where we ought to be headed and that sort of thing. So it was just, again, thanks to the chairman and his staff for um, hosting us there. Claudia, thank you for arranging all of that. Also, a little bit later that day, as soon as I left, uh, that meeting, we went over to the uh, Association of Community Colleges headquarters, and we had a legislative committee on a, and an update. And all of that you're hearing with the legislative update is really what uh, what came of that meeting. Um, many more details beyond that, but at this point, we are giving you the kind of the highlights. Um, and I will be going back this Thursday for another legislative update uh, with the legislative committee. And that concludes my report, and I will answer any questions. Yes. Sir. Okay. Pizza with the president. How often will you be having that? Is it once per semester? Or? So yes, I I'd, I'd been, I think I've been doing that once a semester, and um, I think we're going to kind of take it to the next level. What's happening? A couple things have kind of spun off with that. Um, two things. One, the student government association 
um, has really been integral to, well, they've been at virtually every meeting. I don't know if, we, if they're here just today. They're always here. Um, they're probably busy with, with, with studies, I'm sure. But um, what, we've, what we've developed as a result of that pizza with the president is a stronger bond with them. And I'm, I've begun to include them uh, in the presentation uh, to the students. And so um, that's kind of developed. And then also what they've asked, they, they ask a lot about this board. And they've asked about, um, many of the students are asking, you know, how the board works and how it operates with the college and so forth. And so what's happened is what we've, what we've done to kind of kick that off to kind of brainstorm is and we've asked Chairman McCampbell to join us with some student government uh, um, officers to kind of have a, 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 a smaller meeting to learn more about each other and those sorts of things. And we're going to see if that brainstorming session will turn into something else. So lots, have been, lots has really been uh, generated from that, from that one meeting. It's been a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to be with the students. I said yes when I thought it was just a handful of students, and then he reports that it's 100 and what the last time? So 136. We won't go that Getting a little bit <laughs> nervous now. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Well, it was nice. And, and in that meeting, I, was, I thank uh, the staff who showed up and to, to back me up, because sometimes there are questions out there that I just don't have the details for or the legal perspective. So we, had, we had our counselor there, uh, mostly uh, just to participate and support the students. But uh, I thank the staff uh, who arranged that. Uh, Dean Garner and Dr. Silva and others who put all that together. Thank you for that. How are the students selected, Dr. Scalia? How are the students selected for, for participation? Whoever comes. Oh, it's just okay. So it's wide open. Yeah. Um, I think it's whoever smells the pizza first is who shows it. No, I'm just kidding. No, they, it is wide open. We advertise it um, all throughout the campus, and students come in from both campuses, all different <laughs> programs, and. Um, um, they just kind of come and go as they can. Usually you get the big crowd at the front and then it kind of dwindles and it ebbs and flows throughout the two hours. I was up there for two, two and a half hours. Um, and um, so, and again, we, you know, we, we take the time and repeat the, the topics because they're coming in because they're important. Every one of their questions are important. So it's just wide open. Thank you for doing that. Oh, sure, sure. It's my pleasure. It's a lot of fun. Are there other questions for Dr. Escamilla? Great, thank you. With regards to our pending business regents, um, there's a fairly lengthy <coughs> list of pending items, uh, two of which we're covering today, our quarterly financial report and investments. Um, next month, I know a lot of you have been asking about where the college is on the Civitas yes. implementation, so we scheduled that for May tentatively. Yes. Uh, and then an update on the 60 by 30 strategic plan for the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board is in May, June. And then you can see June and, uh, and July have some additional updates on various items. So as we keep continue to add to the list, we will, and we'll continue to work away at bringing updates on these. Sure. Um, with that, we're going to move into the consent agenda portion. Uh, we have uh, two items on consent agenda today. The approval of the minutes for the regular board meeting on January 24th, 2017, and acceptance of the investments for March 2017. Uh, does any regent want to pull off either one of these for separate discussion? If not, do we have a motion for consent? Move to approve the consent agenda. From uh, Gabe, do we have a second? I'll second. From Elva. Any further discussion by the regents? Any public comments on items number one and two? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying yes. Yes. All, all opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item number three is the first item in our regular agenda, discussion and possible action related to the designation of a general contractor services for the new general academic slash music building phase two project in response to RFCSP number 2017-01 and authorizing the administration to proceed with awarding the contract. Uh, August Alfonso, come on down. Thank you, good afternoon. In November 2016, the college issued RFCSP number 2017-01 for general contractor services for the general academic music building phase two. This building projects around 127,000 gross square feet and will be located in the heart of the East Campus where the cur current English building is located, extending close to the Harmon Center in the north and close to the Heidenfels Admin Building towards the south. 
The design of this new facility was done by Richter Architects in partnership with Brown Reynolds Watford Architects. Our design team composed of David Richter, Aaron Geiser, and Craig Reynolds of BRW are here with us today. Okay. The process was facilitated by David Davila, Director of the Purchasing Department. The following three firms submitted statement of qualifications and competitive sealed proposals for consideration and were interviewed in the following sequence. Bartlett Cock, Beecroft, a joint venture. Fulton General Contractors and Sidalco Fulton, another joint venture. And Spall Glass. The evaluation co committee members include the following. Charles Miller, Superintendent of Facilities. Jeff Huddle, MEP so Superintendent, Delmar College. Dr. John DeHakum, Dean of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Cynthia Bridges, Chair of the Music Department. Lauren White, our Interim Chief of Police. Dr. Beth Lewis, our Provost and Vice President of Student Affairs. Regent Gabe Rebus. Regent Sandra Massbarger. And Regent Nick Adame. And myself. The committee evaluated the respondent ASOQs and interviewed the respondents on March 30, 2017 in this very room. The evaluation committee was charged with selecting the most qualified, highly qualified respondent based on the demonstrated competence and qualifications, which represent 60% of the total scoring criteria. The breakdown of the 60% is as follows. Relevant experience and capability, max of 150 points. Quality assurance and warranty, max of 100 points. Past performance of related work, max score of another 100 points. Past schedule record, maximum of 75 points. Other capabilities for consideration, 50 points. Proposed subcontractors, max of 75 points. Firm location, and have an MWBE submissions, max of 50 points. The total of 600 points represents 60% of the total score. That is the responsibility of the selection committee, 60% of the scoring matrix. Let me explain the selection process. The architectural design team was present. They are non-voting members. They provided the committee with their perspective of each vendor presentation. The committee then deliberates. Q&A happens. Detailed discussion as to the specifics of the presentation of each vendor. And I'd like to uh, 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 praise the members of the committee. It was a very engaging committee. Individual scores are made. Individual score sheets are harvested by David Davila. Scores are then tallied. Scores are then preserved to represent the 60% formal committee vote. Then we wait for 2 o'clock. As announced in the RFQ, the public will be allowed to enter the boardroom at 2 p.m. while the sealed competitive price proposals are read aloud in public. This was done on March 30. 2017 in this very room at 2 p.m. The public is then excused and the committee returns into session. The respondent's pricing proposal representing the 40% of the remaining score are tallied by David Davila and his team from the purchasing department. Note that the 40% weight for pricing proposal is a standard in the state of Texas. The combination of the selection process score and the pricing proposal scores are then aggregated. Once the total scores are presented to the committee, a motion is then uh, made by a member of the committee. In this case, a motion to recommend the vendor with the highest score was made by a board member. And immediately a second was, uh, uh, was voted by another board member. I didn't ask for the committee to 
vote yes if they agree to the motion. It was unanimous. Everybody agreed. And zero voted against the motion. This formula is the board approved construction selection criteria to date. Before I move to the recommendation, are there any questions, sir? Any questions, regents, about the uh, process? Or? This, uh, I was pleased to serve on that committee. It was a, uh, it's I'm sorry. That's okay. It was a last minute uh, substitution for myself, but uh, August wasn't kidding when he told me that three of the best contractors in the state of Texas were going to be bidding on this job. They were all very, very qualified, very successful. I mean, it, it, it was not an easy decision. The numbers were even close. But I'm happy with the decision that we made. And if you're ready for a motion, I'd like to go ahead and move that we approve the recommendation of the committee. Well, if we need other general comments or questions about the yeah. process. What I think yeah. we'd ask August to do was to make sure he covered the process and yeah. yes. understood how the process okay. worked. I want to make sure everybody understands the process before I make the recommendation. Yeah. This is, happens to be the one biggest project yeah. in one project Delmar College ever had, yeah. and the biggest in the 14 bond. Carol, looks like you're punching in there. Yeah, I just, um, as, as we go through this, and, and I know that I had to understand it the first time we went through it as a regent, and I don't know where, where Regent Bennett is, but I think it is helpful for us as we begin to discuss these huge projects. Yes. This is this is the biggest one out of 14 as we move into to the, the 16 bond project in the south side. Probably ought to revisit yes. and, uh, and make sure that we're, we are all still in alignment on the criteria and how the, how sure. the objective information versus the subjective interview is, is handled. And yes. I think there's just some, some information there that we would, would warrant another discussion and make sure that we're all in alignment still. We'll, we'll take that in advisement, under advisement, and do our best to include it in the July retreat, which is going to be focused around um, all things construction, uh, bond-related, capital improvement-related. So we'll, we'll take that under advisement and include it. Thank you. And Delia, if you add that to the pending list, I think it's a good idea. Let's do a deeper dive on what's in there, how does that work, making yes. sure we all understand it. By that point, because we have one more selection meeting next week, I think. Yes, sir. Yes. And by that point, I think all trustees or regents rather have s will have served on a committee, so it'll be a good chance for them to really have seen it and then talk about their observations. And yes. Mr. Chairman, um, I would also like to see a glossary of vocabulary, especially <laughs> when we're talking about MWXY and MRG. And, you know, for those of us that have not been in the process and do not have a background in building buildings, um, I think it would be very helpful to have it in your hand at all times. Uh, because we go so quickly, and I think uh, people assume that we know what we're doing, but it's been two years since we've done this. And there's a lot of water under the in two years, and you may forget some little minute little thing that is very, very important to construction, and it was not any yeah. any way deliberate <laughs> or but it's just that we don't see that sure. all the time. We'll be glad to but, include that uh, for clarification's sake. Which is part of my, we'll my part of my point about kind of revisiting it is that that we've got a group of regents who, for sure, I don't think any of us are in the construction business, uh, and and some of the some of the selection committee members are not in the construction business, and so we've got folks who are making some qualitative judgments on a one through ten scale or whatever the case yes. may be who may not actually yes. understand the depth in which that information is being shared. And, and so I, th that's, that's the piece that I've always had a little bit of a struggle with is there's, there's experience and there's qualifications kind of language that we just don't speak and don't have the expertise in that might be segregated. So maybe it's a third, a third, a third, as opposed to 60, 40, that we sure. begin to look at maybe some alternate ways of considering how we determine those qualifications and minimally qualified uh, Again, there, there's some room for subjectivity in there, I think, but there ought to be a whole lot of objectivity in there about qualifications and experience that, that I think is, like, I know, f I'll speak for myself. When I rank them, I'm trying to be as intelligent as I can be about them, but I don't, I can't tell you why with the definitive terms, one contractor is more qualified than another. I used to give you what my sense is, being an intelligent person and trying to do the best I can 
for the taxpayers uh, of the, 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 the district. So that, that's where my difficulty comes in is we're not experts and we've got this set up so that a group of people who are not experts are determining qualifications. Well, and then you have your experts, of course, and so if they make a comment to those of us that don't have the experience, I'm going, how did I miss that? Or, mm -hmm. you know, it, you don't have the time to go back and look it up and sure. see, is that really valid? Is that what I'm looking for? Because my tunnel vision about it being uh, the music and academic building, uh, I know I had some preconceived ideas about what I wanted, save money, what things were really important, um, and yet here the people that do know about the construction uh, gave some very legitimate uh, questions and uh, opinions. So it gets kind of, you know, I, I, at times I felt very inadequate but at the same time, I wanted to be part of the process. So um, I think we just need a little more uh, sure. a workshop if we need it. No, I, I wouldn't want to waste everybody's time, but you know, for those of us that are new, and if you feel like we need a little bit more help, then here it is. Absolutely. Yeah, understood. I'll I'll just just, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just want to point out I appreciate each member of the committee. You can tell that they really studied the booklets way ahead of time and showing up and that makes the biggest difference you know and, and uh, i'll make sure that there's a glossary of you know data dictionary from from here on yes, yes sir my question would be this in the 600 points that make up the uh, demonstrated competence and qualifications you gave a breakdown for each of those is that published as a part of yes sir, it was part so of the rfq the people submitting know exactly what they're okay. submitting for okay yeah the scoring criteria is published and then what, Carol, just to clarify what I think you heard you say is if a lot of that is uh, maybe difficult to evaluate, the more you can actually quantify what makes up, then, then you have a consistency in how you weight those points in each of those, those subcategories. Right. Got it. Yes. Okay. Other questions I wanna, before? I, oh, I want to just thank David Davila and his staff. I think they did a great job of organizing this. And yes, also they're the ones that actually ran the background checks that provided a lot of information that the committee got. Yeah, very informative and very well done. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just point out that we we did the, the whole process in house this time. Okay. If there's no other questions, you want to do the big reveal? Yes, sir. A recommendation, rather. I'd be happy to. <coughs> On behalf of the evalu evaluation committee, the evaluation committee's recommendation for the general contractor services for the new general academic. Music building project phase two is Bartlett Cock Beecroft. The base bid from Bartlett Cock Beecroft is 45,500,000 even. The total authorized budget for this project is 46,375,000. This leaves 875,000 excess funds available for alternates. The administration further recommends the approval of the following alternate bids. Bid alternate number three, an addition of 222,426 for an open air elevated walkway from the second floor of building C in the new facility to the existing Harbin Center. Addition of bid alternate number four for $289,093 provide landscape planning, soil preparation, irrigation, concrete walks, decomposed granite walks, stabilized earth emergency vehicle drive, site amendments and furnishings, site lighting and other site improvements indicated within the boundaries of phase 1B. That's towards the north of the project. Lastly, build bid alternate number five a deduction of $36,444. This alternate eliminates the materials and labor required to install a mechanically fastened base sheet in the roofing. The administration further recommends to the board the authorization to retain the $399,925 surplus project funds as a contingency for the general music building phase two project 
for site improvements such as further enhancements to the Mike and Saldua Plaza, artistic and or architectural enhancements to this project, and or other academic learning space needs in the near future. So to make summarize, we have 875,000 surplus after taking in all of the alternate bids, <coughs> the project r still has 399,925 in surplus funds. A very good problem. Okay, I think you may have just answered my question. I, I just wanna make sure I understood the numbers. So what you have in, that you handed out doesn't summarize those numbers that way because you show that the base bid budget was less than what it came in but effectively, you're looking at the total of the numbers and what's available. Yes, so the bottom line takeaway is we have just about $400,000 that yes, can sir. be held to use for this project in future ways. Yes, sir. Okay. The other question I had is on um, bid alternate three, which I think you said that was the walkway to the Harvin Center. Yes, sir. Is that the one in their initial renderings? This may be a question for David, but it connects through to uh, that little yeah. David, couple, of raised couple of thing. Yes, sir. It's an open A walkway, but David can further explain. I was asking David about the, the raised walkway, the Harvin Center, and the original plans that y'all drew, there was something that was a possibility to connect in where that little turret or tower is. Yes, that's, that's correct. What it is. Yeah, it connects to the second floor of this building. Open air or? Open air across. Above, it, and above then it's protected and underneath. protected by virtue of the, the walkway. Right. Okay. Under it. Okay. If you... You also can look back to the supporting documents. I added right. that photo of a view coming from the walkway. Mr. Richter, and we still didn't find enough money to connect the two music buildings? <laughs> well, um, let me answer that by, by going back to the design phase. Uh, you know, we're very fortunate right now to have $400,000 roughly left for <coughs> enhancements, but it has not always seemed that that was, was was probable or even, or certainly ever easy. And during design, there were several occasions where we had to shrink and pare back and make tough decisions in order to try to stay within the budget. And that, that enhancement was, as you know, considered and talked about, but it was deemed to be costly in, in relation to its, to, its, to its benefit. And uh, the staff, uh, Dr. Bridges participated in that discussion and in the end, we elected not to include that in the design so that we could keep more important things like critical square footage. And so it was not bid uh, as a part of the- Right, of the I ultimates. remember that. And because of that, it was never, during the bid process, it was never on the table, so to speak. But it was a decision that was made back during design. And I do understand your position on that. But it was, a, it was one of those tough choices where we really felt like uh, the, the benefit, the cost benefit was, was elsewhere. And, and that was um, square footage in, inside the music building, yes, obviously for a studio or yeah. practice or, rooms or something. Yeah, a, yeah, a and I understand that. Yeah. But there is not one single way in the world that you could put a covered, uh, my interest is, the instruments that don't belong to the school probably are not insured. So they're a student and, and uh, a parent are gonna have to pay if there's, you know, our rain doesn't go this way. It always goes <laughs> sideways and those instruments are gonna be hurt going through and it may not happen for except maybe one year out of five. But the cost is gonna go back to the parent. And, and that's my concern. And because some instruments are very, very delicate to the outside going from very strong air conditioning to this humidity and then back over here, and then they're gonna have to be retuned, da 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 the whole rigmarole. So that's my concern. I'm not, I, I am being picky, yes. But, um, but I feel like um, it, it shouldn't be a, a cost for our parents and students to take if something happens to their instruments. But I understand, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Ranger Messberger, I, I, I know where you're coming from and I know how you felt about the, 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 this whole project. And I think working with uh, our, our instructional team, um, we, can, we can resolve those issues and working with those students to, to mitigate that and, 
And uh, we're, there's still much more work to come. There's still much, much more work to come. And today is a, a, a celebration of a wonderful project and a great step forward. It is the largest single project um, of this bond. And um, it is, um, we're in a great place right now. There's still some opportunities for enhancements. We've made some recommendations. Uh, Mr. Alfonso and I worked together to kind of co-author that last paragraph there to a lab. But uh, we also want to be careful as we move ahead because we have lots of um, opportunities in front of us, but we want to be very cautious as we move ahead. We're, we're, we're grateful for the budget that we've been entrusted with, and, and today's a great, uh, we, I, I just look forward to getting this started. We will not forget that. There's still a conversation to be had. Thank you. Thank you. If I may add, I just want to note that the design of this facility by Richter and BMW is first class. This is going to be it is. a landmark on this side of the community. It is first class. It is. So once this is built, this is going to be a first class facility. And if I, if I may share briefly one, one comment since I'm here at the podium, but in, in almost 40 years of practice, I can literally say, and this is no exaggeration, that I have never been involved in a public procurement with this level of quality participation on the part of contractors and the level of effort in competition and competition proven in the final numbers it's just never, it's never happened. And Del Mar is the beneficiary to, to the, the caliber of the contractors, the effort, they, every one of them, as we say in the business, bid it to get it. They all, they all worked really hard to be competitive and, you, and there, there was no bad choice. This is one of, those, one of those choices where the best value is just that. It's, the, it's just the best of three good options. So really all of them should be uh, commended for the level of effort that they did. And, and I believe Del Mar and the public should realize that uh, the value has been served to Del Mar. Uh, there's just no question about it that uh, the, the, the fact that we brought in the base bid and all the alternates under budget in a, in a market that's quite active right now on the, on the broad scale is, uh, is, a very, uh, is a very big win uh, for the college. David, I think we have some of the representatives from maybe all three firms. Would you just take a moment and introduce them and so we can say thank you to all of them for, for bidding and... Mr. Paul Glass? Yeah. Paul Glass? Paul Glass. We appreciate you all. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fulton Coast Council. Fulton. Okay. Mm -hmm. Beecroft. Interestingly, they're all in different corners of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree with David. It was a, uh, it was a hard choice and their, their presentations were phenomenally a plus for such a big project. Are there other questions for um, August or David Richter, our architect, or anyone else involved in the team? I, I would just like to thank the Richters uh, for helping us get to this point from the design aspect. And um, Bill Wilson with WKMC as well on the front end. It's, this goes back to, I know Bill's somewhere back there. I thought I saw him. So I just want to thank everybody involved. I know Elizabeth's not with us. She's with her mom who is ill. And, and, and we, we, she's in our thoughts. They're all in our thoughts and prayers. But, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to her, looking forward to her getting back as well. But thanks to the Richters and, and all involved. August, thank you too. You've done a few things to get us here. <laughs> now a motion. After all of that, August, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion to accept the committee's recommendation to the board, um, selecting Bartley Cog, B. Crawl, joint venture as contractors of this project. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Mr. Watts. Any further discussion by the Board of Regents? Any public comments on item, agenda item uh, number three? Hearing that, let's take a roll call vote if we could, Delia. Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Mr. Scada? Yes. Ms. Hutchinson? Yes. Mr. McCampbell? Yes. Ms. Ness Parker? Yes. Mr. Riva? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Mr. Watts? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you to everyone involved. Appreciate that. Um, item number four on the agenda, discussion and possible action related to request for partial assignment and assumption of tax abatement agreement related to MG residents. I think um, Mike Culberson from EDC is here and uh, with a couple of other guests. And um, 
welcome. Good afternoon, Mike Culbertson with uh, your Corpus Christi Regional EDC with good news. I have with me Parrish uh, Jones with MNG Polymer, uh, MNG Resins. Uh, the item before you is you have a tax abatement with MNG. And by the way, they're in compliance. I, I still have one more thing I have to check on them, but uh, they're doing really well. They plan to start commissioning uh, later this year and then opening uh, either at the end of this year or first of next year. Basically, the tax abatement has in its clauses the ability to assign it to another to another company, which was uh, for ownership, and the tax abatement would continue. This one, however, is just a little different in that they want to assign part of the project. Now, you remember the project uh, advertises $750 million. It's going to be way over that, but $750 million. Of this, what they are going to do is use desal to help alleviate some of the re uh, responsibility for water, but they have another uh, entity within MNG underneath the same uh, ownership called MNG Waters, and they would like to assign those portions of that of this project to that company. So it's a, just a little weird, but it's we don't really have a you know sister sister relationship on in the tax abatement. So we're asking the regents for approval of this. Now they would still go through the same um, compliance audit uh, in a unit. Just so you know, the, uh, they also have the same type of tax abatement with uh, Nueces County, and that was passed earlier, that was approved earlier by the, uh, in the first week of uh, March by the county. And we're ready for any questions. Uh, just right now, uh, the, uh, the amount of the, uh, of the assets that would move over 17 million as they grow, that will increase, but it won't be, you know, 100 million of the 750. It'll probably be somewhere in this neighborhood of 17. Are the two companies owned by the same owner? What's that? Are the two companies owned by the same owner? Yes, sir. Just different companies. Yes, sir. They're they're in the same. Sort of cleaning up the paperwork. Yes, sir. They're effectively just sort of cleaning up the paperwork on it. Right and. You know, they don't want to move it over and lose the abatement because something like this could. The net effect is that they're adding a related company to the agreement. Right. But with respect to Del Mar College, its position remains yes, sir. intact. It's revenue avoided. neutral. Yep. There, there's, no, there's no revenue yes, change. No. That's right. This is just assets. Mm -hmm. And I assume it comes from, with a recommendation from... Uh, yes, I've reviewed it, and, I, and, and as Mr. Culberson uh, said, the county's already approved it. They're just asking for your consent. They, the agreement is between the two parties. They just need your consent since you're part of the original abatement agreement. And so the recommendation is that, yes, you go ahead and approve and give consent. Are there other questions or comments about this? Uh, yes, sir. Um, besides the, the – are all the taxing entities – doing the abatement does everyone come together and the county the city and the education people public schools the city doesn't have a tax abatement because they're in the industrial district okay but the county does and the city does the uh the schools they're a separate entity and that's it's really not involved with me but yes they will go through those they have not gone through them yet They could do it without the the amount of the of the of, of the uh, investment is not such that that they would have to do that that they would have to do without this 313 tax limitation. It really has no effect on their agreement. They would still hit their investment uh, their investment uh, milestones. And remind me, Mr. Chairman, how long uh, how long does the is this going to last? It's for eight years. It has three years of construction and uh, five, no, it's for ten years. It has three years of construction, seven years <laughs> after that, and they are in. They have completed their second year. Uh, does this amount get any smaller as we go through the ten years? It's so. not. It's not a decreasing. There no, are no so decreases 100%, 100% all the way construction and then 70%. What is the percentage for the remaining? It's 70% on the out years. So it's 
So it's weighted on the front end because of construction because they're not right. generating revenue yet, and then it reduced it down from 100% to 70%. So it's going to take them 10 years to finish building? No. 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 They'll be finished it this year. Two years. They're two years into a three-year build, okay. and they get 100% abatement. Then once they start operating in a year from now, they'll get a 70% abatement for another seven years. Yes, sir. So we get 30% of that 100% we've been giving them for three years? Correct. Or we can keep that. Based upon the current, and, a, and based right, on the current rates, too. Um, under the, the current political and financial things we talked about earlier in the meeting, um, I wonder if it's as smart for us. Uh, I know we want to be a team player, and we certainly like all the business, but um, I, I would like to have a little more consideration about these abatements and I just, I just want to weigh it. I mean, if we're doing all of this, how much of that do we get back? And because the state is giving us less money and we're having to go to our taxpayers, uh, we want to use that money as best we can for our students. Yes, ma'am. And um, I just want us to be sure that we're on a level playing field, that we are getting, because I feel like, okay, you're getting the abatement from us, and then we're providing your workforce. Yes. And those, uh, certainly your workers and your employees are going to go spend money in the community, which is going to give us more tax. Uh, but that sales tax is probably not as much as we would like. But Or, or the buy houses that generate property or tax. Or the buy houses, true. Yep. But uh, are, are we really seeing a, a, an evil an even playing field well, there. Just as a Can reminder, we, and on the other abatements we've done, we periodically get reports on those. We've shown that they've increased, they've, they've, the rising they tide lifts all boats and it, it raises it. It's on a limited period. Um, we're part of a standard abatement agreement that we agreed to. We can certainly revisit that, but it's, it allows the EDC, when they're going out marketing companies, to use that standard abatement. Oh, I, I know. I know you're, I, you're married I to one. I live with an EDC guy. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and one of the things I, you know, that we in the EDC like to discuss is when we do these abatements and we offer them, it is an enticement to get them here. The exactly. question is not whether you're going to get 30% or 100%. The question is whether you're going to get 30% or nothing. Yeah. If, if you don't give it, and Louisiana is given a $100 million check to move in there, the chances are you're not going to get it. And if you're not going to get it, then it doesn't matter whether you get 30% or 100%. And let me just add, if I can, um, Regent Messbarger, that we are members of the EDC. Right. As well, uh, Lenora Keys uh, sits on that board. And so these decisions are made, uh, first of all, they were made long time ago, relatively speaking, some years ago. And this was at a time when, you know, the proportion of, of incoming um, industry or the potential industry partners that were coming were, were um, just a few billion dollars. You know, now it is what it is because we've made this place so attractive and, and, and the numbers have just grown exponentially. And the return is, um, you know, the rising tide lifting all ships has been proven. And um, so I just want you to know that we're, we're in on these meetings. We're, we're in close contact. We work very closely with Mr. Culberson and team. And um, it, it's, it's, a, it's paying off bigger than we could probably even estimate, but even imagine. But that 30% versus no percent, that's a great point, Mr. Culberson. And one of the things that when we get people like this, when we get companies like this, it, it makes us more attractive. It gets us on the map for other yes. for other projects that not normally would have thought of Corpus Christi as a as a landing place. Yeah. Oh, and I, I understand all of that. Yeah. Uh, believe me, I do. <laughs> but I, d I, do. I just um, want to be sure that we're aware um, that because of the, our future in the next five yes, years and yes, where we're going, that I am concerned. Yes, ma'am. And um, uh, the staff and what they do, I never question. But I may have concerns about some things. I understand. Yes, ma'am. And I just want the business group to know that we believe in you. We want growth. We want our children to have um, jobs in this community. We want other people from other communities to come to work. Um, so, uh, but I want it to be a two-way street. I understand. Yes, sir. Ed, I is this a 750 
million dollar maximum abatement? Minimum. No, it's it's they they have to meet a minimum of seven hundred and fifty, or they start getting reduction in it. So if it's a billion dollars, we're still getting an abatement on one hundred percent. Correct. Okay. For the three years of construction, then it goes to seventy. Okay. But, but you would want that. You would want the extra two hundred and fifty million. Because ultimately, the more they invest, the, the more when we right. it flips it just sweetens the shot. Benefit yeah, and I, it goes I, up. Two, two thoughts. One, after 10 years, we get 100%. Right. Now, <laughs> let's we focus on what we don't taxes. get. Let's focus on what we do <laughs> get. And, and, I, right. and I think we see that places like this last at least 50 years. Right. And right. I probably think that there's there's probably a, a good workshop discussion to have a uh, the, philosophically about the abatements, sure. a, a, a conversation a with the EDC to talk about what are – what the what those numbers look like for us over a 10-year projected period with kind of everything that we've done i think that's a valuable discussion for us to understand the bigger context of it and, and what those look like but today's is revenue neutral this is this is just creating separating one entity into a so, big entity and a little bitty sister entity right. so it really is revenue to, neutral to be, for a decision be, that we've oh made. yeah we, we've and had we're this obligated discussion to, yeah. in my kitchen a lot <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll be glad to take it if, the, if it's the wishes of this board we'll be glad to to bring it back in a topic in a whatever yeah. format necessary we, we, we have it okay. documented okay. You were gonna say. to be clear given the conversation that's gone on you are not voting on whether or not to grant an abatement no, today we've already done right. that we've already okay. done yeah. that yeah. Yeah. Right. So done back in 2012 right I understand, but just for clarity's sake, so that everybody knows what they're voting on. <laughs> Do we have someone willing to make a motion to approve the, uh, the change? So moved. Motion, and we have a second. Any further discussion by the Board of Regents? Any public comment on item number four? Hearing none, all in favor signify your approval by saying yes. 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 All opposed? Or abstains? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, sir. Thank I'll you, speak Culpson. on behalf of Lenora. We thank Parrish for bringing all of his training to Del Mar College. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Parrish. Thank, thank you. you, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> Item number five, um, discussion on possible action related to the college's quarterly financial statements. Dr. West is actually going to cover financial statements, and then she's going to roll into the quarterly investment report. Yes. Good afternoon. In your packets are the financial statements for... The quarter ended February 28, 2017, and in there you have an income statement, the balance sheet, and then the balance sheet that we provide for you for the plant fund. <coughs> so for the financial reports, we're now six months into the year, and if you look at the income statement, both revenues and expenditures are tracking along very, very similar to last year. Um, and just really no major variances that I have to talk about unless you all have a question about one of those. Any questions, Ed? <laughs> I, I'm good now. So good to have some, another account on the board. You, you and Ed are now our yeah. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so no questions, we need a, a motion to uh, accept the financial statements. I move to approve Motions. financials. From Gabe, a second. A second from Elva, thank you. Any further discussion? Any public comments on item number five? All in favor of uh, their approval signify by saying yes. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Dr. West. Yes. Now you know we're going to evaluate your presentation compared to how Linda does normally, so. <laughs> no, no that, that's, those and, are any, big. Anything under an hour work. <laughs> <laughs> those are big shoes to fill because Linda is amazingly intelligent. Um, and she could not, she sends her regrets that she could not be here today. She had a schedule conflict. So you're stuck with me to go over the investments. But we do work very closely with Linda's office. Um, you know, on our investment strategy to make sure that we are using the best strategies that follow the college's investment policies. And of course, our policies are in accordance with the Public Funds Investment Act. So I, you know, the markets right now are just incredibly interesting. Um, and you know, what hasn't affected us here at the college is the fact that the Fed has begun to raise the interest rates.
and that is great news uh, and you will see um, in the slides that I'm going to show you in this slide right here is just a snapshot of our investments and it's it's a good slide because it shows you you know by quarter and you can see for February 2017 we're at the height of our year because we've just uh, collected most of our property tax revenues and of course the big difference between when you look at uh, February compared to May is that we have the series 2016 tax bond funds uh, included in those funds so that's why you see that big difference um, but because of, of the fact that we're now able to move uh, some of our funds out into investment securities rather than at the banks um, you can see our, our yield has gone up to the 0.721 and that's compared to our benchmark of the 0.64 which is the six month uh, treasury t-bill and just to ask the question, we're doing that without any undue risk, correct? Yes. It's meeting all of our risk parameters in our investment policy? As I said, in accordance with our just investment policies. Just highlighting that point. Yes. <laughs> okay, and then this slide here I think is, is good because it shows you that back in November uh, we still had quite a bit of our funds still at the bank um, because during the low interest rate times, our bank uh, depository Wells Fargo was actually giving us a really good um, premium savings account that was paying considerably higher than what our state investment pools were giving us but now we've started to move our funds out into these various types of securities and you can see we have a large portion in the investment pool which is um, if you look down here at the bottom the pools are offering 0.97 which is almost one percent um, and and what's really nice about the pools that it's, it's totally liquid so you know you have daily um, access to your funds <coughs> um, but we do have some um, investment activity in agency notes <coughs> fees, um, com commercial paper so we're actually it's the first time since like 2008 that I'm actually getting to um, <coughs> invest rather than just having all the money in the bank so and so this is this is our uh, mainly our operating funds and then the next slide it's titled 2016 but that's out of our 2014 bond election but it's primarily um, the funds that we issued last year the 74.7 and you can see that we do have a lot sitting in the pool but we are putting our money out into the commercial paper agency notes and munis with the help of Linda's staff. Go back just one slide for a second. Okay. So on that one it's really both a rate going up, it's a volume because you've reduced the bank and you're going to the pools. So right. it's a double double benefit. Right. And of course now the pools are paying uh, 0.97. Right. So in the bank at the highest rate there was 0.2. Yeah, you've almost doubled the so rate <coughs> and doubled the, by looking at the graph, the percentage is more than doubled the, the dollars in that. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, and do you all have any questions? Any questions for Dr. West? Hearing none, do we have a motion to accept the so moved. motion by Mr. Watts? Second, by Sandra, any other discussion? Any public comment on item number six? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Motion carries, thank you, Unanimous. Um, uh, on the advice of council, we're gonna defer number seven till after our closed session for now. So we're gonna go into closed session. Uh, I'm sorry, we're gonna defer it. I have to do pu general public comments first. Does anyone have any general public comments at this point? Okay, hearing none, uh, if you'll uh, please sit tight while I read the required uh, language and then we'll go into closed session here. Okay. Uh, pursuant to Texas Government Code 551.071, consultation with legal counsel regarding pending or contemplated litigation, settlement offer, or possible discussion, and action in open session with the seeking of legal advice from counsel on pending legal or contemplated matters or claims with possible discussion and action in open session. And Texas Government Code 551.074A1, personal matters, 
regarding the employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer employee, including review of regents' duties, responsibilities, and statement of ethics, regent wants with the possible discussion and action open session, and the annual evaluation of the college president and annual board self-evaluation with possible discussion and action open session. So it is um, 2.16. We will take a regent just a very brief break uh, while we clear the room, and then we will go into closed session. Thank you. I'm calling us back into open session at 3.43 p.m. Uh, do we have anyone that has a motion that they would like to make? Yes, Mr. Chair. I move that we authorize our general counsel to expand the scope of the bylaw 1J investigation concerning Regent Watts that was previously authorized by the board at the March 21st board meeting to also include other conduct and information. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Uh, do we have any further discussion by the regents? Do we have any public comment on the motion that's on the floor? Hearing none, let's do a roll call vote, please. Tom Giordano? Yes. Keith Bennett? Yes. Smith Estrada? Yes. Ms. Hutchinson? Yes. Mr. McCampbell? Yes. Ms. Nesbarger? Yes. Ms. Arriva? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Motion carries unanimous. Uh, Mr. Watts was here through the majority of our closed session and left, I guess, about 10 minutes ago for our record keeping purposes. Uh, in light of the motion, we're going to defer or table item number seven for today and uh, move that to a future meeting. Uh, we will move now to calendaring. And Regents, you have a calendar in front of you, but I want to start with an item actually for uh, the Friday the 28th is, if you haven't already, um, Responded, it's the um, Employee Service Awards. Uh, it's a breakfast reception at 8.30 and the service awards at 9.30. Uh, that's always an inspirational event. And uh, you, I believe you had an invitation at your uh, places when you came in today. In May, our board day is the 9th. Um, again, hold open on your calendars for now uh, from 10 o'clock on. And as we refine that agenda, we'll let you know if we need that uh, morning for workshop or not. Uh, that. Um, Evening is graduation, or I'm sorry, that Friday evening is graduation on the 12th. Another exciting time. And you have anything you want to talk sure. about, Dr. Scania? Well, I'd just like to let everyone know that our keynote speaker for our spring uh, semester's graduation is Eliz Elizabeth Chu Richter. She's a local architect that's uh, more than just a local architect. She's a great uh, pillar of the community, and uh, we look forward to uh, that, that event. It's going to be a great night. She should have interesting perspectives. She just rotated off, I believe, the last year as the national president of the American Institute of Architects, which took her not only around the United States, but literally global of representing the architects uh, around the world. So that's it'll be pretty interesting. Uh, then in June, uh, you should have just gotten an email this week about the CCAC conference uh, for those that are interested in attending. Uh, the GED graduation, we now have that on our calendars on the 8th. Uh, board day on the 13th. Again, hold open from 10 a.m. forward. Uh, Stringers, uh, Dr. Escamilla's favorite event, Stringers for Scholarships events are the 16th and 17th. You see on your calendar. And then, of course, uh, July, uh, we have the budget workshop on the 28th. And I thought we were going to put in an August calendar with tentative dates. So uh, we'll get those out to you here soon because we, we know they're not all set in stone for August because of the various dates, but we need to try to you know, let you know as soon as possible. It's not mine, is it? It's someone else's. Oh, it's right here. Here, go ahead and use mine. Oh, it's right I, no wonder. Right there. It's got the dates in there. Oh, I'd look, uh, yep, it does. I just don't have an August page on mine. Sorry. Um, so, uh, summer graduation the 18th, uh, the public hearing tentatively on, on the 21st and the 24th, and then the 29th is the meeting to adopt. And no wonder you're all looking at me like, you know, your, yeah, your package I didn't just. I get one at all, so that's a. <laughs> oh. Do y'all don't get copies of this? Don't y'all? Yeah. Okay, well, we'll make sure we have it. I didn't. That's right. Make sure next time <laughs> everyone gets me one. I don't know, where to, I know where to find her. Any questions about calendaring or any additional calendaring? Did you get this? Okay. All right, hearing none, we will adjourn at uh, 3.47 p.m. Thank you, folks.